light of the world, treasure of heaven, brilliant like the stars in the wintry sky, joy of the Father, reach through the darkness, shine across the earth, send the shadows to fly. Light up the world from the beginning, the tragedies, the time, no match for your love. The great heights of glory, you saw the story. God, you entered in and became one of us. Good to see you all here this morning. It's great to be around the people of God. It's always a joy for me. One of the highlights of my week is just uh, being here on Sunday morning. Hopefully, uh, you know, you're looking forward to a great morning of worship. I mean, I know I am. Uh, we've got Pastor Jace back speaking to us again. Where did you miss him? I'd say tepid at best. That's it. I mean, that's what you got. But uh, you know, anyway, hey, what can you do? Uh, we do want to, uh, again, welcome you to the morning service of Briam Bible Church. We're so glad that you came to worship with us this morning. Um, we do want to uh, just let you know about uh, uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, busyness and craziness, you know, going on during this uh, time of the year. Uh, plenty of different ministries, uh, I mean, that are going to be taking place. Uh, and a couple, uh, you know, public service announcements. We're going to start with one of those. Uh, the marketplace, I mean, is being moved from out there, I mean, under the, uh, the carport, 
uh, into the uh, cafeteria to help uh, you know, solve a few of the challenges that we had with that. Um, so, you mean, if you go out, you mean, it's not there, that's why. I mean, you know, so after the service, not during the service, but after the service, you know, you can go out there. You I mean, we usually have plenty of uh, good things. By the way, good job last week taking away, you know, like 30 turkeys and all that other stuff. Like, good job, guys. Like, we, like, like 97% of that food went out and was used. So, I mean, good job with that. But it will be here in the cafeteria. Uh, and, I mean, the children, I mean, are going to be picked up upstairs. So we're making a change, you know, with that, I mean, again. So just be aware of that, parents, uh, I mean, as you're, uh, you know, going to get your children you know, after the service, you mean, this morning. Um, also, Genesis, uh, you mean, uh, they're, uh, the Genesis Women's Clinic has some needs, uh, and uh, they are uh, running dangerously low on supplies. And so there is a box, you mean, in the foyer, uh, and their current needs are on the slide up there for you. So if there's uh, any of those things that you can provide, you know, for them uh, to help them along, remember that they are privately funded. They don't get, uh, you mean, any government money. They don't take that so that they don't have to follow the government's stupid rules with all that. So, uh, I mean, this is a, a great ministry to the, uh, to the ladies of Pottstown. Uh, and uh, so if you can, you know, provide any of those things, I mean, there is a box in the back that you can participate, you know, with them in that. Uh, also, Kids Christmas Caroling is coming up uh, this uh, Friday. Uh, you can see that they have a good time, you know, doing that. So, uh, you mean, you can bring them out, you know, for that this Friday evening. You mean, they have a good time. They have some snacks, you mean, afterwards and just have a lot of fun, uh, you know, going out there and brightening some people's day, you know, with, uh, you know, singing some Christmas carols to them, getting the message out. Uh, and then the, our kids program is going to be next Sunday night. Uh, and um, that's uh, going to be a really exciting time where you can come out and, uh, you know, see those kids excited about uh, Christmas and, uh, you know, playing the different parts that are there. I understand that they're going big this year, Nick. Is that true? All kinds of sets, like, you know, I oh, mean, this is just craziness, right? <laughs> the biggest you know, so we've ever done. That's the biggest we've ever done. So you want to come out and support that. Also, parents, remember that practice, I mean, is today. Uh, lunch is provided, you know, right after the service. Uh, so don't go home. I mean, those kids need to be here for that. Uh, and then also... Our nativity, uh, you know, is uh, going on. Signups are taking place. Uh, we are getting, uh, you know, really close, uh, I mean, to the nativity. On December 11th is going to be the setup, you know, for that. Uh, that's going to be start. Now, we set up almost all week. So, you mean, if you are able to make it, I mean, the most important days, we would be Monday, I mean, you know, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, you know, in that order. So, Monday would be most important, Tuesday, second, you know, Wednesday, third. Uh, we do need, you know, people for all of those days for sure. Uh, and um, if you have construction skills, I mean, if you own your own business, if you're able to come out, if you just feel like taking a mental health day from work, Nick, do you ever feel like that? Every day. Wait, wh- what? <laughs> Yo, he works? <clears throat> Boss, he works? I didn't know. Okay, I guess he does. Um, so we'd love to have you, uh, you, know, for, uh, you know, for that. Do you need to have construction skills? No. I mean, you can just come out. There are plenty of things to do. I mean, do you have to be a guy? No, I mean, there's jobs inside. There's jobs outside. There's all kinds of things that we need. Um, So that's, again, an all-hands-on-deck. We also need to make sure that all those character parts are filled. Uh, And so there will be sign-ups. I mean, afterwards, I mean, you go. I mean, sign up for one of those parts. Again, you don't have to say anything. I mean, people drive around in their cars. You don't even know they're there. You just kind of talk, have a good time. Uh, I mean, it's a great uh, great opportunity to serve the Lord and people hear the gospel. So it's the most important thing. Uh, So make sure that you're signing up for that. And then along with that, tomorrow... I mean, our, uh, our, our uh, uh, Hit the Streets, you know, ministry, you mean, is going to be, uh, you mean, out, uh, you mean, handing out flyers, I mean, and they're, uh, they're right here. I mean, there's going to be uh, two piles on the back table back there on the corners. Um, and uh, they're going to be meeting here at church at 1245. So if you're free and you're wanting to uh, hand out some, uh, you know, some flyers for our nativity, you're going to be in Pottstown inviting people to the nativity. So, uh, you know, you can go back there and uh, you can, uh, you know, participate, you know, with them. You mean in that 1245 here at the church, that's when they're going to be meeting. Um, they're going to go just for a little bit, you mean, into Pottstown, hand some of these out. Uh, if you're not able to go with them, but you do have some people you would like to invite, please take some of these flyers on the back. Great, put it in the hand of someone. Say, hey, you know, why don't you come? It's a great thing. You can stay in your car. You don't even have to come into the church. You mean, just uh, drive around, you mean, and enjoy it. Uh, you mean, and hear, you mean, the true meaning of Christmas. So go and hand out, you mean, invite people so we can make sure we got three full nights, you mean, that, uh, that we can have people hearing, you mean, the message of Christmas. Uh, and then also, I mean, we have, uh, you know, one more, you mean, uh, uh, announcement, actually two more. Uh, the women's retreat, you mean, coming up, you mean, here, you mean, as you can see, uh, I mean, on January 12th through the 14th, I mean, there's a QR code there for registration, or you can sign up even in the back afterwards. Uh, that is, uh, you mean, a, a bit away, you know, but uh, it, it will come quickly, being that uh, we're in the holiday season. So uh, please come I mean, and sign up for that, ladies, especially if you're, uh, you know, just wanting to get to know some of the ladies in the church, or, you know, you're just, you know, been around for a while, and you're just looking for a connection. You I mean, whatever your needs are. Uh, it's a great time where they can just get away, uh, I mean, and spend some time together, I mean, as ladies, uh, you know, being able to, um, you know, to, uh, to just, you know, draw closer to the Lord and to one another. 
Uh, and then also, I mean, don't forget, I mean, about, uh, I mean, our uh, senior singles, you know, ministry, which uh, is going to be, uh, you know, going, and I know there's not a slide for this one today, uh, but, uh, you know, make sure that you're paying attention to that, and we're going to be going to a Diener's restaurant and also to Sight and Sound uh, for the miracle of Christmas, and so if you'd like to uh, sign up, you mean, in the back for that, uh, you know, that would be great, I mean, as well. So with that, we'll turn it over to Pastor Nick. Good morning, everybody. Once again, I see a bunch of faces that I don't recognize. So welcome to all of you uh, visiting guests here for the first time. Thank you for uh, coming and joining with us, worshiping with us today. And uh, I know it's probably hard sometimes to come to a church that you've never been to before, and they speak kind of like a language you're not even familiar with. Like you hear that we have a farmer's market. We don't. We don't have a farmer's market. It's, it's what we call it. There's free food available at the end of the service if you want any. Uh, drive through nativity. What in the world is that? Well, I guess you just have to come and find out. But the other thing is that uh, we also do what, I, what we like to call New Song of the Month. And what that means is that every month we sing one of the songs in the worship set. The song set is the same for the whole month uh, so that we get a whole month to really learn it together. And so uh, this month being December, it's appropriate to learn a new Christmas song. So uh, the, the one for this month is called How Low Was Our Redeemer Brought. We're going to teach it to you. You can stay seated right where you're at. And now if you know it already, sing along, or if you just want to try it, you can sing along. But we're going to try to introduce this one for you the best we can. Our Redeemer brought the King who held the stars, the helpless in a maiden's arms, and pressed against her heart. While sheep and cattle raised their voice, the bay could speak no words. The ever flowing spring of joy. Come to share our thirst. How low was our Redeemer brought? The Lord the world's obeyed. Would stumble as he learned to walk upon the ground in vain. The one the angels bowed before One kneel to wash our feet And be at home among the poor Though he owned everything Gloria, Gloria In the
Scripture for this morning comes from Titus chapter 3. So would you please stand as we read it? The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. We went over that last week. And now continuing on, Verse 9, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. We're prone to arguments. We know that. But we are thankful that we have a Savior who brings an end to our struggles. So we're going to sing together our first Christmas carol this season. Come thou long expected Jesus. Father, thank you for this season when even unbelievers are seeking some sort of truth. They all recognize the need for peace, for joy, for love, yet they can find it nowhere in this dying world. Thank you for providing it in your Son. As we continue on in this service today, let us be encouraged by that truth and know that you are the one who can bring an end to division if we simply submit to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet somebody and then take a seat.
Good morning. Feels great to be back. Seems like it's been forever since I have uh, been up here. I probably in the last, I don't know how many years, this is the most weeks I went right into a Sunday morning message. But uh, before we get to all of that, we have a few uh, items to deal with. First of all, one of the great things is welcoming new uh, uh, members into the fellowship. And this morning we have five people that we're going to acknowledge who have just become uh, members of the church here. Uh, first, uh, Pastor Jeff has certificates for them. And uh, first we have Pat and Denise DeGisi. Uh I'm not sure where they are. Oh, stand up. There they are, Pat and Denise DeGisi. And then we have Ashley Rosden, who I believe is over here. There's Ashley. Make sure you welcome these dear ones into fellowship. And if you have never joined, uh, maybe you want to come. You just have to know Christ your Savior and make this your church home. Uh, Virginia Weber. Oh, you walked right away from her, Jeffrey. And stay right there as well. Virginia, welcome in. And then Deb, Deborah Finneran. Right? I got that right. So great to have new people come in. If you're interested in, in uh, becoming a member of the church, see us. We know that there are many. The church uh, continues to grow. And to that end, I just want to remind you, for those of you who are new, you may not know this, but always at the end of the year, the last uh, Sunday of the year, we always have a special offering, usually for some project that we're doing here around the church. Uh, and uh, one of the areas that we have really been trying to boot with as the church grows, and there's been so many more people, it's using this uh, facility to its maximum, you know. And uh, one of the things you've seen over here is an unfinished parking area. We needed more parking. And we got to that point where we were going to pave, and then the township said, now wait, now wait, now wait, now wait. We thought we had approval. That is in committee now for getting some kind of zoning variance. We're moving forward on that. Uh, you can pray that uh, we get all the approvals. Of course, it's not going to be paved now till spring, but uh, um, the monies are pretty much there for that. But one of the other areas at the same time we want to develop is above the gymnasium, there was a whole unfinished area, an auditorium area, and, uh, and our youth ministries and college and career group and the Spanish ministry are all growing. So we wanted to complete that. It's going to be like a mini-type auditorium, which seats a little over 100 people. Uh, we have all the plans drawn, and we have some money toward that, not complete. And what we take in here at the, that last Sunday, unless you designate otherwise, is going to go toward uh, that. We're waiting for final approvals there as well to expand the building. Uh, and so pray about that. That'll be on the 31st uh, of December when we have our... Uh, end of the year offering, and a lot of times people give especially to that, and uh, it's so exciting to see God using this building, isn't it? And uh, all the use that it's got, it's getting used more and more, and uh, that's hard on the building, but at the same time, that's a good heart on the building, isn't it? The people are uh, being taught the Word of God, and, and God's using it uh, for the church and for homeschoolers and for other people that use the building all the time. Uh, we're just so thankful for what God has given us here and made us stewards of. So uh, be in prayer about your part uh, in that. Okay, we're going to turn to our study in Titus uh, chapter 3. And uh, I want to, uh, we're going to begin in verse 11, uh, 8 and go to verse 11. Um, uh, and I thank you for all that were concerned about me. It's my fault. The, the last time I preached, I was going to tell you, hey, you're not going to see me for uh, a couple weeks. This is the time of year where uh, I travel a little bit. I was around a lot of times, but also a time where um, I want to give the younger guys more opportunities to preach, so I kind of kill two birds with one stone. Uh, I get to go hunting a little bit or travel a little bit, and they get to get more experience. And uh, it's great to see uh, all the talents, the gifts, uh, the preaching ability that we have here. And uh, I hope you appreciate it, Pastor Jeff. And, and even Nick did a good job, huh? How about last week? That was fantastic. And you're actually going to get to hear Pastor Caleb. He's going to, do the, he's going to close out the year for us on the 31st. And, uh, uh, but all those people who sent me stuff said, are you okay? Were you sick? And, uh, you know, did they get rid of you? Uh, I have no plans to retire. I addressed this a little while ago when there were some rumors going around. Uh, as long as God, God knows how to get rid of me, just... Uh, you know, take my health away or, or move in the hearts of the elders to ask me to do something different. 
Uh, but uh, you'll see that from time to time uh, that I'm going to try to uh, allow uh, the younger bucks to get a chance up here uh, more often because they're so very capable. And uh, we're, just, we're just excited about what God is doing, not just on the pastoral staff, uh, but so many people who are gifted to teach in the men's groups, the ladies that have so many gifted teachers. God is just blessing, you know. Uh, when you study God's Word and you put God's Word as a priority as we have here at Berean, then God raises up people to teach that Word. And uh, right down to our Sunday school teachers and the kids that are getting taught the Word of God. What a fantastic uh, opportunities we have here. I just love the church. Uh, I love the body of Christ. I love being a part of it here. And so as we're talking about the church this morning, it's a very uh, appropriate thing. Uh, and uh, we, we continue uh, to rejoice in having the opportunity uh, to serve Christ here and to serve you as well. And uh, I know that, uh, to remind you as we're coming to the end of the book of Titus here, that Titus was sent to the church there in Crete, to, Crete to, or he remained there after Paul left, to set things in order. And, and it was a difficult ministry. Uh, hopefully we don't have so many difficulties here, but one of the reasons that we don't is because we do things biblically. And so uh, we know that the church isn't perfect, is it? Uh, and uh, that the pastoral staff isn't perfect. And Lord knows that Jace is imperfect, uh, but he makes provision for that and teaches us how to overcome uh, some of those issues. And we know that the church, the modern day church, needs to take heed of these things. And we begin here in verse 8. I'm backing up not to re-preach uh, Nick's message. As I said, he did a great job of it, but it gives us the context where uh, Paul says to uh, Titus, this saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. He's saying, listen, you need to live carefully. He spent a lot of time talking about them being in sound doctrine. He's going to come back to that. Uh, but he says you need to live uh, uh, carefully. That is your charge to set things in order. This is a charge not only to him, but to all leadership, that the church needs to be set in order at all times. And uh, that we're supposed to, first and foremost, as a body of believers, live uh, worthy of our calling. And so a lot of times he says, you know, I want you to be careful about doing good works. A lot of times, uh, as uh, fundamental Bible-believing Christians, we're very uncomfortable when it comes to works. Because we don't want anybody to get the idea that you work your way to heaven, or that you work your way to salvation, or that works have anything to do with our salvation at all. And I think sometimes we tend to then downplay the importance of works. Where Paul says to him, look, I'm you need to insist upon this. And you need to insist upon good works. It's first about our, our uh, salvation, and then what comes out of that is our works. I want to just remind you again of how that works in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. I know I refer to it all the time. It's a, one of my favorite uh, passages in Scripture. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. We talked about grace not too long ago. What part do we have in grace? Nothing. It's from God. All salvation is about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, not by your own works. It is a gift of God. It's not a result of works. This is where we're going to go. Okay, so works have nothing to do with our salvation. Absolutely. So let's not talk about, let's, we don't have to worry about works. Yes, we do. They're very important. Not as regards to salvation, but as a result of our salvation. Not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. So that no one may boast. There's no works involved in salvation. You can't boast about the fact that you were smart enough to believe it or to find it, or God extended it to you because you were better than your neighbor. That has nothing to do with that. And then verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship. He saved us. He's brought us into the body of Christ. And we are created in Christ Jesus unto our four good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, we can't downplay works, are they? It's very important. It testifies to our salvation. It testifies to a change and growing life. It testifies to our obedience to Christ. Works are an outcome of our salvation. They reveal a transformed life and heart. 
And so as, as believers in Christ, it's not enough just to know the doctrine. It's not en enough to know the teaching. It's not enough to know that you're saved. We, we have to work because of our salvation. Works are not voluntary. Well, I'm saved, and if I feel like helping out, if I feel like getting involved, if I feel like witnessing, if I feel like doing the things that the church needs, that's a bonus for everybody. They're not voluntary. They're obligatory. They're a natural result of our salvation. Our lives need to testify to who Christ is. If our lives are no different than the other persons in the world and everybody that we come in, in, into contact with, then why would people be drawn to Christ? See, most people are drawn to Christ because they see something different in believers. It's one thing to tell them what we believe, but we have to show them what we believe by the way that we live our lives. Sometimes we forget the, 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 the prominence that works are supposed to take in our life. You remember back in chapter 2, uh, verse 14, he said this. Well, we are supposed to be waiting, verse 13, to give you context, we're supposed to be waiting for the blessed hope, for the appearing of the glory of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You looking for the second coming of Christ? Yo, man, you can't, I, I'm telling you. It's a great event. We're ready for the Lord to come. But he says, while you're waiting... There's something we should be doing, not just hanging on away. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Are you zealous for good works this morning? I mean, do you want to do things for the Lord and for others? You know, what, what's a zealot? You know, what is a zealot? It's a fanatic, isn't it? This afternoon, there are going to be a lot of zealots for the Eagles. Some of you are there. Some of you get more excited in a week about the Eagles playing the 49ers than you do about serving the Lord Jesus. But I use that word. You're supposed to be zealous of good works. You're supposed to be avid about them. You're, you're supposed to be a fan of them. You're supposed to be uh, passionate and fervent about that. You're supposed to be on fire for serving the Lord Jesus and for doing good works. And not like a piece of straw that goes up in a flame and it's gone in a second. You're supposed to have this long, burning, fervent fire for the Lord, striving to be faithful, uh, striving to be true and righteous and noble and fair-minded and Christ-like in everything you do. Does it save me? No. But because I'm saved, I'm supposed to be conformed to the image of Christ. I'm supposed to be like him. And so we have to ask ourselves all the time, do, am I honoring the Lord? Am I edifying the body of Christ? Am I, am I building it up? Do I consider the needs of others? Am I willing to sacrifice for them? Do I have, do I have godly attitudes and godly actions? Am I a lifestyle Christian? See, there are a lot of Christians out there, you'd never be able to tell that they knew the Lord. Not by any actions or attitudes of theirs. Not until you really press them. They say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I believe those things. I, I'm born again. But there's, there's no lifestyle there. Paul talked to the Romans about that in Romans uh, chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. He says, look, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in your zeal. What zeal? In your fervency, in your... In your, in your in your burning for the things of the Lord, for good works. Be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord at all times. That's what the church ought to be doing. Is it perfect? No. Does it have problems? Yes, because it's made up of people. Because we're yet imperfect. But I want to remind you, that Christ loves the church. As imperfect as we are, he loves us. And our position is one of without spot or wrinkle. He's going to present us to himself, and we're going to be with him forever. But now the bride of Christ has flaws. Our duty is to have zeal for good works. You know, because salvation is a free gift and because by the grace of God, 
Sometimes our works get shoved to the background. Not really all that important, Pastor. And we go out and live like the world, and nobody's drawn to Christ, and no one's excited about the great privilege it is to be free indeed in Christ to serve him instead of the passions of the flesh. There are problems in the church. That's why that word but is here. He contrasts in verse 9, you have this nine, you have this contrast. He says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and dissensions and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Paul speaks very frankly here, and the scriptures always do. It's just modern day people, we try to, you know, get around the edges and, yeah, you don't want to be too bold. You don't want to, you don't want to say things that are going to step on anybody's toes. You know, don't, don't, don't really criticize. Uh, Paul's not afraid of doing that, and we can't be either. We should do it in love. But he says, listen, you, you have duty, but you also have to have discernment. Now, you're going to have people in your midst sometimes that are going to major on the minors. And he says, you, you need to avoid that. You need to steer, steer clear of it, the word means. And, and, and you need to give those things a wide berth, those things that can distract you from what's really important in serving the Lord, what's really important in the church. There was a similar attitude. Uh, you know, this isn't just, okay, well, uh, you know, the Christians, they were, <laughs> uh, they were a rough bunch. But a lot of churches struggle with that. Just by example, you can see it, it was even happening in, uh, in Ephesus. And when Paul wrote to Timothy, another young pastor, he had to say this to him in uh, 1 Timothy 1, 3 to 7. It's not going to be up, up there for you, but uh, I'll read it for you. He says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding, without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. You know, I have people who don't know what they're talking about. Paul says, be careful of these people. They're going to take up your time. They're going to, they're going to major in, in, in the minors. You need to steer clear of those kind of things. You need to be careful of that. These are foolish controversies, he says, he says to Titus. He says, stay away from these foolish controversies that arise. You know what the Greek word there is? The moros. The moros thesis which means moronic controversies, studies, talks that, that end in nothing. They're debates. He said, these are stupid things. Where do we get moron from? It's absurd. It's dull. They're debates of speculation. They're debates that really don't mean anything at the end of the day. Things that are secondary at best even. I sat under Dr. Lloyd Perry when I was up at Lancaster Bible College many years ago, and he was, uh, he was a great writer of books, and, and he was a super guy, really, and I caught him right at the end of his ministry. He actually had retired and came to Lancaster to teach part-time, but most of his time was spent as traveling around the country and settling disputes in churches. And he taught us about being pastors and about the kind of things you get, and he said, listen, guys, most of the disputes in your church will not be about theology. They'll be about stupid little things. He had just come from Chicago and, and a big church there that was splitting apart. You know what the big fight was? He said, you know what the argument was? They had gone into a building project and they were fighting about the color of the carpet. And he said, the whole church is disintegrated. Now, I know that there were, there were personal issues behind that. I know getting called and getting consulted uh, about a fight over people uh, in the church that were ready to split over a vacuum cleaner. So-and-so hid the vacuum cleaner from me. And, and now we have people lining up on sides and do, uh, over a vacuum cleaner. One church 
that I read about was fighting over finances. Well, there's something to fight about, Pastor. Yes, they had a congregational meeting, and someone found a 10-cent flaw, that there was a mistake or overlook or a rounding area or something over 10 cents. And the whole church almost got, there was almost a fist fight there until some guy said, listen, I'll settle it. Here's 10 cents. Can we move forward? You see, Pastor Denton used to always tell us that at the best of us, if we scratch the surface, what's underneath the old man, the old nature. And we wish it weren't that way. And we could stand there and say, you know, in churches, we don't have the kind of petty issues that happen out there in the streets and in the world and in the workplace. Sadly, we do far too often. Hopefully, that's not the case here. We need to stop acting as morons. He uses the same word, <laughs> this moronic, many times in the Scripture. Actually, in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, the Greek one, in, in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 21, I just want to say, hear this, O oh foolish and senseless people. Hear this, you morons, who have eyes but see not, who have ears but hear not. Boy, we can descend into that so quickly if we act in the flesh. And yet the church is filled with these kind of things. And sometimes it, almost, it takes on a spiritual flavor. One of the things that happened in the early church, or a little bit later on, maybe in the Middle Ages, they, they had big controversies and discussions about things like, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Well, boy, that's worth spending hours and hours on. That's going to really make a difference in people's lives about the dietary laws. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. One of the things that I see on the internet now is, uh, some of you might have seen it, uh, you know, it's like, well, you know, if you, if you use the name Jesus, you can't be saved because Jesus isn't his name. It's Yeshua. Yeshua HaMashiach. And if you don't pronounce it that way, you're lost. Come on. That's much ado about nothing. Some of you are like, uh, well, it's a good reason to stay off the internet. You want some issues to deal with that are important? You start talking about the inerrancy of Scripture. You start talking about who is Christ. You start thinking about, do I know him as a personal Savior? Am I walking in the Spirit and under the direction of the Spirit, or do I walk in the flesh? Am I looking for the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Those are the things that are the weighty issues. But a lot of times people bog down on the minor series. So are they, they talk about these, these genealogies, which came up several times in the epistles as well. Avoid these foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. Genealogies, and you know, it's more than just what's your lineage, you know? Like, like, like a spiritual, you know, tracing your lineage back. These, a lot of these people would take the Old Testament genealogies, and they put fanciful interpretations of them. They take Jesus' genealogy and add things to it, or they try to fit themselves in. We see some of that today even with excessive numerology and stuff. I was looking at something with the, uh, in prophecy because it's so prevalent right now, and a guy made this big, long thing, and a couple other people picked it up. You know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the different colors there. There's black and red and green and white. You know, those are the colors of the flags of, the, uh, of a lot of the Arab nations. And so, uh, therefore, that's what that's referring to. And I'm like, that's just fanciful stuff, you know? And by the way, pale doesn't, I don't know if that means white anyway. But those four colors, they say, are prominent in, 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 the, in the Arab nation's flags. And so uh, I'm just thankful that the United States doesn't have green in its flag, right? Uh, so I don't want to get swept up in that. But people can get sub, you know, can really get tied up in fanciful interpretations of the scriptures. And uh, so people bog down. They bog down in experiential things. Pastor, 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 I was driving from Pottstown to Boyertown the other day, and guess what? I saw Jesus in the clouds. I saw a cloud that looked just like Jesus. Now, we need to do something about that. My question tends to be, how do you know what Jesus looks like? I wish you'd take a, I took a picture of it, Pastor. I'll send it to you. 
And it's like, okay, I'm trying to, trying to see. Jesus was on my toast this morning. Do we have time for that kind of thing? And I mean, and, and if you, you know, if you believe that God gave you a special sunrise, so that's fine. But we're not going to build a doctrine around it. You know, that, those are the kind of things that maybe you just say, hey, that's between me and the Lord. I'm not, and if I say anything this morning, I feel like, geez, Pastor Jace is attacking me. I am not attacking you. I'm just telling you what the scriptures here say, that listen, we have some major issues to deal with. And what he's telling uh, Titus here is, don't allow yourselves to get sidetracked on some minor issue that, that uh, has very little to do with the church and the body of Christ. And he gets to something that maybe seems a, a little more important there. He says, or they have these quarrels and dissensions about the law. Now we know that. That was important, some of that. Some of that was, hey, you know, how much of the Old Testament law do we need to keep the law? With, in, in Paul says the whole book of Galatians that we went through was written about basically about keeping the law as well as believing in Christ. They're mixing works back in, and circumcision in particular. Does a believer need to be circumcised? Uh, you know, and, and Paul put, it, Paul put the, the kibosh on that. Uh, and, uh, uh, but we have those kind of things today that people want to revive. Hey, pastor, do we need to live by the law? Pastor, you know those dietary laws are really good. You know, and I was reading this book about the dietary laws, and because of that, I don't eat pork anymore. Pastor, I, 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 don't, I don't have pork anymore. I said, good, that's more bacon for me. <laughs> Jesus fulfilled the law, right? There you go. You can leave the lobsters alone too. I don't really care for those, but my family does. Maybe the price will come down. New Year's, New Year's Eve's coming up. Now, if you want to follow the Old Testament dietary laws because you think that's healthy for you, fine. But if you think that adds to your salvation, we're going to have an issue. We're going to have a problem. If you think that me or I don't think Pastor Jeff's going to, I think Nick, the guy's made of bacon. He's not going to stand up here and preach against bacon. I don't know why I'm picking on Nick this morning. Shows you did good last week, Nick. He said, you don't want to have dissensions over these things, wrangling, quarreling, rivalry. That's what dissensions mean. And it has, carries that idea of bitterness. See, that's where these things come in a church many times. They're personal. People have personal vendettas against one another, and they mask them and try to turn them into something, something spiritual. He says, disputes about the law. You know what the word is for disputes there? <laughs> In the Greek, machos. Machos. It's a military term, by the way. I guess that makes sense, that you're a macho man. You're, you're a combatant. You're, you're ready to fight. Uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, he actually uses the Greek word logomachia, word battles. That's what he's mostly talking about here. Fighting and disputing and, and arguing about these things and then getting a personal vendetta against one another. As a matter of fact, when he set out those those uh, characteristics that people should have for leadership, he says that you should be amachos, non-contentious, not a fighter, not someone who's looking to quarrel and, and, and fight at the drop of a hat. He said, you don't have to have word wars about the law and its part in Christianity. The, the, the law was fulfilled and, and, and met at the cross, wasn't it? Now, we can discuss some of the things and and, you know, what, what part does the Old Testament law have for us? And a lot of times the, the obedience to the moral law is still in place. But in particular, trying to make uh, uh, some kind of division over the ceremonial law, it, it's just not profitable. What we eat, what we drink, whether we should be circumcised or not, whether people should be cremated, what kind of clothing we should wear. What should it be? Modest. There you go. End of contract. Our clothing should be modest. How about that? Let, let, let's just go with that. 
And, one of the, and people try to lead you down these roads and get you off the track of the gospel and the, and the central cores of the thing. What about, what about your God and, and his approval of slavery? And actually, we're going to deal with that. That's coming up in the book of Philemon. This is one of the things that the enemies of the cross, they want to go right away. You know what? God endorsed slavery. By the way, he didn't. He regulated it, but we'll get to all those kind of things. All those things with the law, we have to be very careful of because they were set aside at the cross. I'm going to jump ahead to, if you can find it there, to Hebrews 7, 18. Because those things were dealt with at the cross. If you can pull that one up, Hebrews 7, 18. That's where I'd like to get to. I kind of, kind of went on my own there for a little bit. There it is. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. See, the law had no power to save us. That was Paul's argument in Galatians. Christ saved us, and we don't put ourselves back under the law. He fulfilled the law at the cross. It, it, it was useless to us as far as saving us. That's what he's talking about there. It was unprofitable and worthless. Don't let those things take up your time, Titus. Don't let it take up the time of the church at Crete. These things are unprofitable. They serve no real purpose. That takes discernment. That's why you have leadership. They're unprofitable and they're worthless. Matayoi, which is another word used sometimes in the Scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, uh, Septuagint again, even new. It's another word for idols. They're all matoi, the idols. What does it mean? They're worthless things. They're things that serve no purpose at the end of the day. They're futile. That's what it means. These things are unprofitable and they're worthless. They're empty. They're dead. They're futile. The same word that's used in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, talking about the resurrection from the dead, and people say, well, you know, you can perfectly have a church, and it doesn't matter if Jesus is risen from the dead or not, it's not necessary. Some people would say, you know, we can be Christians and not have to believe in a bodily resurrection. And Paul says to them, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is metaoi. It's futile. And you are still in your sins. You see how crucial? how crucial the resurrection is. Those are the things that we can spend our time on. Did Jesus physically rise from the dead? And what happens to those people who say that's not necessary? They are heretics. And that's what we move to, because not only do we have to have discernment, uh, but uh, we also have to uh, stand on our doctrine. It comes back to that at the end of the day. The believer's doctrine. Verse 10, as for a person who stirs up division, as for this person who stirs up division, as for the person who is a heretic, that's the word there, Her heretics. They're heretics. A heretic is one who brings division. After warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and is self-condemned. The heretic. Heretic is a person who refuses to accept true doctrine as established in the Scripture. And they go about setting up their own factions and their own teachings. And I want you to note here, that we're not saying, I'm not saying, and I know the board is not saying, or any of us are saying, that you can't ever come. We're not trying to ever silence legitimate concerns or criticisms that you might have. That's what we're there for. Bring them to us. If you go out and complain to others and set up factions, then you got a problem. Then you are a problem. Then you're a troublemaker. But come so that we can address it. Come so that we can look at it. And there are certainly things that you can legitimately question at all times. We're not trying to silence legitimate concerns or criticisms. This is about persistent and insistent perversions of the truth. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, 
Verse 3, it says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthful, unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. There's your machos word, logos machos, with pro, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil, sus, evil suspicions, and constant friction amongst people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Imagine, you know, they can do these things and pull these things out, and, and we have them in abundance. Not here at Berean, thankfully. But we have them in abundance on your television sets and on, and, 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 and on your electronic devices and stuff. And Paul wasn't afraid to name names. He does throughout Scripture. We don't have time to turn to them now. Men that should know better. Men who have been puffed up. Men who abandon the Scriptures. You want a name? I'll give you one. Andy Stanley. Huge, huge name. Big, big church. Says the Scriptures aren't important. So we've been too tied to the Scriptures. We've got to cut off from Scriptures. Why? Because he doesn't agree with the Scriptures. Especially that he's become a champion of the uh, LBT, GQ, whatever they all are. And the transgender movement and things. He's a heretic. What does Paul say to do then? Warn them once, then twice. Attempt to correct them. If they won't hear, then you need to cast them aside. What do you do with heretics? I know what the Catholic Church did with heretics, they burned them. I know what some of the Puritans did, they burned them and dunked them, or they fined them, or they threw them in the stocks. Is that in the Scripture anywhere? No, what does Paul say? Don't have anything to do with them. Kick them out. If they want to believe those things, they can believe those things, but not in your midst, not here. There have been people over the years, sadly, that we've had to say to them, you want to teach that? We disagree. We've discussed the Scriptures with you. We've done a study with you. We're showing you why we believe this and why your view is aberrant. Then they insist on believing it. Okay, you can believe it. You can teach it, but not here. You have to go your own way. We'll turn you over to the Lord. It's kind of following uh, the principles of Matthew chapter 18, which you can do individually. Actually, this is an individual thing, but even those principles. If your brother sins against you, so that involves a lot more than just doctrinal error, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. If I hear someone teaching or Jeff does, the first thing we do is sit down with them. Or if they come with a question and say, I, I want to teach this, I believe this. We lovingly sit down with them and discuss it with them. And they say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go out. I'm going to win converts. I'm going to... I'm going to go out and preach in the midst of your flock. I'm going to use my Sunday school class. Oh, no, you're not. You, you know, the elders will take that privilege away from you. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. you go through this process. Then every, that every charge may establish by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What is it? Someone to avoid. Someone to shun. That word's actually uh, contained in this uh, definition here. Um, after warning him once or twice, have nothing more to do with him. Shun him. Cast him out. The church needs to do more church discipline today. It's not something that we relish. It's not something that we like to do, but it's something that we have to do. He says, reject them, shun them, avoid them. Paraitiomai is the word. You want to know why that's important or why I think it's important? Because it's a Greek term that was used for forfeiting a wrestling match when you saw your opponent. I remember when I wrestled in high school, 10th grade. I think I was probably 15 years old. Right up here in Birdsboro, it was the first time I was ever going to wrestle in a varsity match. 
I was at the, and believe this or not, I was in the very lightest weight class. I couldn't make the very lightest weight class. And you have a wrestling match, and the first thing you do is you weigh in to make sure that your opponent's not too heavy for you. I went to that thing. I could have passed, it was like 95 pounds in 10th grade. I could pass that weigh in fully clothed with army boots on. I went to up here to wrestle. <laughs> And I was not a wrestler. I was drafted into the position because they couldn't find guys that small, all for the football team. And they walked this guy in to weigh off. You weigh off the 295-pounders. This guy came in, and he was a full-grown man. That weighed 95. He had a beard. The guy stripped down naked, and I'm like, I give up. This is a man. I lost to that guy that day. When I lost, his wife and kids came out of the crowd to celebrate with him. I, I, I went to parrot Timmy my to this guy. Paul says, make it, make it. You see these things, he says, don't even engage them. Don't have anything to do with them. Walk away from them. Why? They're self-condemned. And it is, and it's hard a lot of times if you're like, you know, how can I discipline a man? A lot of people say, I don't want to be in church. Say, I would never want to discipline someone. Most of the time you've ever had to discipline someone, you know why? Because they self-condemned. They wind up not, not pitying them because they brought it upon themselves. Knowing that such a person is warped, is perverted, and sinful. And it's actually there... It's in the perfect tense. They're warped. That means they're settled. They're set. You know, I've seen people in that attitude that have come, sat in my office. And you say to them, here's what the scriptures say. And they say, I don't care what the scriptures say, Pastor. And Jeff knows and the rest of us know when someone comes into a meeting and says, I don't care what the scriptures say, the meeting is over. Because if you don't care what the scriptures say, then quite frankly, I don't care what you say. Because the scriptures rule the day. And if you say, I don't care what the scriptures say, we're done discussing this. And I go home and sleep just fine because I don't have pity for a person who self-condemns. I can be sad for you. I can pray for you. And I still pray for some people who walked away from here by making foolish and foolhardy decisions that are sinful and I can pray that God will change your heart. And I can say, if you come and repent before the Lord and before this board and before this church, you will be restored. Because God loves his church. But if you walk away from it and cause division and cause strife, I think Nick said it the other week, and I reiterate it. You are skating on the thinnest of ice. And I would not want to be in your position of saying, I don't care what you say. I don't care what the Bible says. I only care what I say. That is a dangerous position to have. But thanks be to God we're not in that position. Amen? Thanks be to God that... When issues do come up, that you have a men in leadership positions here who are men of prayer, who are men who are looking to reach out and to solve issues, not cause them, solve problems. And we know, I guess we've all played the troublemaker in our life at one time or another. If not in the church, then in your family, not your family, then at your school or at your workplace. Just don't get hardened into those positions. I ask you today, as we wrap this up, in conclusion, are you a worker for the Lord? Or are you being worthless? Or are you being a waste of time? I know that's a little hard-hitting. But read this in its context. This is hard-hitting, isn't it? Let's be workers for the Lord. Amen? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much.
for your word today. And we know that we're not perfect. We know in standing we are, but we know in practice we aren't. We look forward to that day when our standing and our practice will be one and the same. We know it's coming. We look forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Until that time, help us to occupy until you come. Help us to be conformed to the image of Christ. Help us to turn from our sin and embrace what is right, to be zealous of good works, to strive to do things that are well-pleasing in your sight, that things might go well with us, well with the church, and well with the world. And Father, we'll thank you for these things and praise you for them in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Just to be clear about something, I don't consider being called made of bacon an insult. As far as I'm concerned, bacon is God's gift to the church. <laughs> so by transitive property, you know what that means? Okay. Well, we're going to read God's true gift to the church, John chapter 1. So would you please stand? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was sent a man from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, come, oh, come, be my will and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely. Until the Son of God appear, rejoice, rejoice, dream and you will shall come to the O Israel. You may be seen. If there's anyone who did not receive the communion elements and like one, if you just put your hand up now, I'm sure one of the uh, ushers can take care of you. There's some up here in the front uh, for sure. Just get your hands up good and high so they can see you as they come back through the aisles uh, so you get uh, the elements if you'd like to have them. As we come to the table of the Lord this morning, it's a time to remember the one who gave us life, both physical and spiritual. And it's given us the privilege of serving him until he comes for us again. It's all by him. He calls us to say, do this in remembrance of me. That Jesus gave us this wonderful privilege and opportunity to set free in him. To serve him. To serve one another. To fellowship together. All possible. Only because... He went to the cross and took our place there. Before we go to this time where we receive the elements, I'd like you to take a moment to prepare your hearts, to remember the one 
who's given us all good things. Let's pray. Please continue to examine your hearts as we sing the next verse. scriptures tell us that in the night in which the Lord Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and he passed it out to his disciples and he said take heed this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me now just before we partake of the wafer which is the symbol of the body of the Lord Jesus given up for us that day on the cross let's thank him together by saying, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body, which was given for me. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body, which was given for me. Now, as you partake, remember your Savior. scriptures tell us that when he had supped, the Lord Jesus took the cup, said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as he drank it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you do eat the bread and drink the cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. He's coming again for us. Let's remember him by saying, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood, which was shed for me. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood which was shed for me. Now, once again, remember your Savior. Would you please stand as we sing together the song we learned earlier today, How Love Was Our Redeemer Bride. How low was our Redeemer brought, the King who held the stars. They helpless in a maiden's arms and pressed against her heart. While sheep and cattle raised their voice, the baker speak no words. 
the flowing spring of joy, I'd come to share our Thank you for giving us your salvation so full and free that we who are far away can be made brought near by your sacrifice. We thank you for this table that reminds us monthly of what you've done for us. May we never lose sight of it. May we always keep the main thing, the main thing. And instead of looking to various genealogies and arguments about the law, instead continue to focus on that which is central to our faith, the gospel story, that we who are far away have been made brought near because the kindness of God appeared first. Thank you for that. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.